Well, thank you, Fiona, and uh, it's especially nice to have Fiona introduce uh, me. She's uh, been our uh, patent case manager in the past, all the way up through negotiating a lot of licenses for us, and now uh, she's at the very top of C4C, and it's been fun to have that ride with you. Fiona, I have a slide of you on the, the very last one. So uh, thank you, thanks to everybody for uh, coming here this afternoon first. Um, this is going to be a very personal journey. Um, it's uh, historical um, by design. And so I figured I'd start with what I faced when I first came here to interview. Uh, these scary faculty from bioengineering uh, who have also over the years been very involved in commercialization. Uh, Alan Hoffman, uh, who was a very special uh, collaborator as I'll highlight, uh, he's been involved um, in both of these companies. Um, Buddy Ratner, um, another serial entrepreneur uh, and also one of the entrepreneurial uh, faculty fellows. Paul Yeager, another uh, big company starter, and Tom Horbert, Tom Horbit, sorry. And uh, they weren't smiling uh, when I came here to interview, let me tell you. They were very tough um, around the table. They had a lot of hard questions uh, for me because I didn't really come from engineering. I came from a biochemistry background. And it was a big experiment um, started by another uh, person we came to call the creator in bioengineering, uh, Lee Huntsman, who subsequently went on to become president. Um, he's now, uh, I guess, past president of the Life Science Discovery Fund and a real force of nature um, around the whole state. Um, it was their idea to start something called molecular bioengineering at the time and to bring in non-traditional faculty such as myself in new areas. Uh, and the idea was to mix it up with people who were working in engineering and, and hopefully some good uh, things might happen. Good things really from the beginning meant new technologies for medicine. So that was the start. Uh, and so I bought into it. I decided to come here um, into a department that I would barely heard anything about, bioengineering. Uh, rather than a chemistry or biochemistry department. And the first person I really connected to uh, was Alan Hoffman, uh, who worked with uh, a class of polymers called smart polymers. And Alan likes to smoke cigars, um, and one of the very first things he did was invite me out on a very sunny day um, to uh, this nice part of campus where we have our columns. I guess that's historically where the university started. And he pulled two lawn chairs out of the back of his car and said, why don't we come over here and talk some science? And he brought a notepad. And this pretty much is the drawing that we came up with, um, back of the envelope to say for sure. Um, but these little squiggly lines meant something to us. <laughs> uh, the little Pac-Man model uh, was a model for an enzyme. And uh, the squiggly line is a smart polymer. And the idea that, that we drew up on that very first meeting was that if we attach the polymer near the active site of the enzyme, shown by the wedge here, um, in one state the polymer might be extended and keep this open, but in an alternative state that these polymers can be induced to form, they would collapse and block the active site. And so we could create maybe a new switch for enzymes was the idea. So you can make more uh, pretty models of this if you go back to the lab. And back then I actually knew how to do something in the lab. Um, and we could uh, go to our computer graphics machine and draw this out in a little more detail. And the idea really on the right here, again, this is a higher resolution view of that enzyme, a real enzyme now with the substrate in yellow, that's the molecule that this enzyme works on. And by genetically engineering the attachment site over here and the polymer so it would only react at that site, we could merge the capabilities of the enzyme with this stimuli responsive polymer. And again, in this state, the polymer is very hydrophilic. It's extended away from the enzyme. And this is an on state because uh, the molecule that the enzyme works on can gain access to the active site and then chemistry occurs there. These polymers have a really cool feature though. 
they're, smart is a cute name, but it actually means something in materials. It means a material that will change between two states very sharply in response to a defined signal. And you can make them, by changing the chemistry, be responsive to pH, temperature, or light were the three that we mainly worked on. And so with a very small change in pH, very small change in temperature, or a particular wavelength of light, we could collapse a polymer and it would block the active site and the substrate couldn't find its way in there so no chemistry could occur. So that would be the off state. But it's reversible if it's a true smart material so that by reversing these signals, the polymer could be induced back to this conformation. So this is a way that we wanted to gain control over the activity of proteins in general um, was through this. And there, there's really no great way to do this. So we certainly have always needed better ways to, to talk to these kinds of uh, proteins and devices. And the polymer serves as both an antenna, it receives the signal, but also then an actuator to perform a function. I'm not going to go into the you know, details of the technology so much, but this turned out to work. We could show it worked, and academically, when you're an assistant professor, one of the things you, you would hope for is to get a very high-profile paper out the door. And uh, we got a very nice paper accepted into Nature, um, which was very exciting. This is a picture of Alan and I after we got um, our acceptance letter from Nature. Um, but in addition, we kind of were thinking about applications from the beginning. And so we also um, went to the Office of Technology Transfer at that time and uh, told them about our invention and uh, applied for a patent. That was really the start of a long, unexpected journey. And I want to again note the year of the publication was 1995. I came here in 1992 and pretty immediately Probably the first sunny day that I came in February would have been August, maybe, uh, given the Seattle summer. Actually, it was a beautiful summer. It was probably June that year. Um, and uh, that was 1992. So it took us three years to get to a publication and a patent application, but that was the start of it. One of the very first issues that we came upon um, was one of the standard issues, really. Um, was this just cool research? Certainly, it was cool enough to get into nature. That's all I cared about. Um, was it a licensing opportunity? Was this something we could take to a diagnostic company or a therapeutic company? Um, they would be interested enough to license uh, the intellectual property? Or was it a company? And uh, back then, I think we were initially probably thinking of licensing it, but it, the issue did come up that we might think about starting a company. And back then there was a kind of a dilemma back around this question, whose job is it to decide uh, the answer to this? And it's a very, it turns out to be a very complex answer, who decides? There's a lot of competing pressures um, around uh, the university on whose job it is to decide. And it turns out to be uh, probably no single person. So what we launched into was an analysis of where this technology was. And roughly speaking, the kind of uh, evolution was, is it research, is it development? Is this a technology where there's a prototype? We could define a prototype, you know, and certainly we weren't to product yet. But a lot of discussion around where this application was. In a naive way, I thought since we had demonstrated it with multiple proteins and enzymes by that time that, that probably we were closer to a prototype. And I think in retrospect that, that was probably an error. Proof of concept keep, kept coming in. Do we have proof of concept? Well, in some respects, academically, again, once you publish, you think you have proof of concept. But it turns out that's quite different from um, the viewpoint of industry and investors. Another question that came up was how much would it cost to get to proof of concept, if not all the way to product? And this question I'd love to ask, uh, I'd love to ask you here now. Like what would be the order of magnitude? I teach in the business school every August um, 
with a program that brings uh, people doing commercialization in Taiwan into the university to learn a little bit more about how it's done in the U.S. And I break uh, them into groups and ask this question, telling them just what I told you. Because it's, it's, usually you don't know a whole lot more about the technology and you still have to make this assessment. Well, the orders I get would range typically from 500,000 to 1 million to 10 million to 100 million. That's a lot of orders of magnitude. Really hard to assess that, and it assumes for each person who's answering it, where do they place this? If they place it all the way to product, and they're thinking about therapeutics in humans with clinical trials, you could go up to a billion dollars if you really wanted to answer it that way. If you're thinking about diagnostics and uh, not even doing clinical trials, then maybe 10 million might be the right answer. But this really got us thinking about this in a real way, the dollar question. And then again, there was a role of ourselves. And for some reason that I, I don't really even remember, I think we decided we wanted to form a company. It just sounded kind of a fun thing to do. And uh, there wasn't such a big startup climate back then. And that was a little controversial that we wanted to start a company. And at the, the bottom line, honestly, was if I looked at our technology, we didn't really know what it was going to do. It was kind of cool, but we did, ourselves didn't have a clear idea. You can turn proteins on and off. Well, you could turn a, a therapeutic enzyme on or off at the site of cancer, or you could turn an enzyme on or off in a diagnostic assay. And that was kind of where our answer was. But it's not really a very satisfactory answer at the end of the day either to an investor because you're like, well, which enzyme? And why do you want to turn an enzyme on or off at the site of cancer? Uh, why do you want to turn an enzyme on or off in a diagnostic assay? How does that, what does that provide in an assay? That was our answer, kind of, well, let me think about that for a while. So what was happening now around this time, um, there was a lot of patent process activity. The UW made a big investment, interestingly, you know, from a money standpoint. Uh, but I was writing a lot of the patents <laughs> for the patent attorneys, and that didn't turn out to be such a great thing. Um, and uh, in addition, I would say there was very little strategy around uh, what types of patents we might write. Uh, was it compositions? Was it applications? What kind of barrier to entry strategy would you want to erect around this technology? There really wasn't that kind of sophistication. And I'm going to come back to this point now about, you know, I'm old enough to, to have seen the days where there wasn't that here at the UW, but now it's really exciting it is here. Um, and uh, it's, in my opinion, one of the most important points that C4C has achieved. Um, we were giving lots of academic talks. You know, you get a paper in Nature, and it does a lot for your career. Um, you get invited to meetings. And the type of meetings that we go to, there were industry people. And that was actually really nice, because uh, we got to know some people at particular com companies who were interested in this, and interested enough to come to the UW and talk to the UW about it. Um, OTT had some advisors in to uh, consider NUCO, what, what was the answer where I had silence, what could we build around how does this really help you in diagnostics or therapeutics? And we made some contacts with some venture capital groups. I would summarize it though, however, as, as still you know, not really going anywhere. There were lots of ideas, there were lots of competing business models proposed, diagnostics, therapeutics, no real champion and, and certainly no killer app emerged. And, you know, what I was beginning to do, honestly, was lose a little interest in this. <laughs> it, it was so hard. Every advisor, or every person we talked to had a different idea, and to try to sort through it without somebody really taking charge was beginning to become a waste of time, honestly. And that was a really big early problem, was we just didn't have the connectivity to the local community and people in the local community who could help us uh, really, in a more firm way, come up with answers about what this technology was about. 
Well, not for the first time in the story. Uh, we did come across some good luck. Um, Alan Hoffman uh, had an old friend, um, Richard Dick Smith, uh, who was a serial entrepreneur. Unfortunately, in a sense, he was a rocket scientist, literally. He helped design the booster rockets out of Purdue for the Apollo um, rocket missions. He had spun out several companies around combustion technology, super successful guy, and, and just a, a really incredible mentor as well for me, myself. So that was all to the good, and, and, and Dick kind of was at a, at, at the retirement point, and he just decided he always wanted to do something in medicine and biotechnology. And so, so the idea was he might get us started, and then we would find the CEO at some point who really had the domain experience. We were certainly financed by the founders. Um, that means myself, Alan, and, and uh, Dick Smith put in more than his share. But it, you know, it was low cost to begin with. And the, the idea was that we'd be operating in the UW labs by subcontract, and I'll, I'll explain that. So this was a slide I pulled from the time. This was kind of how we described biomolecular switches. It was intelligent materials meets, meets biotech. And that was an exciting concept to people. They, they really got that conceptually at that level. Where it got a little more dicey is under the arrow again, you know, medical diagnostics, therapeutics, somehow, maybe. Um, but even back then, we were thinking about processing samples, purifying uh, targets, diagnostic targets, turning enzymes on and off. Again, we had that, that was our first demonstration. It just seemed like you might want to do that somewhere in a new, brand new way like this. And uh, we had some interest from people in that di general diagnostics field mainly. So it was mainly turning out to be a diagnostics play. The key developments with starting the company were the following. There was a business plan written for the first time. Dick actually wrote a business plan. Didn't make a lot of sense in retrospect when I go back and look at it, but it still was something written down that was a business plan on the cover. He estimated preliminary financials, and you know that at least got us to discussion points with investors. The key point was that he negotiated an option with the UW, not a license, and that was a kind of an important point, I think, with where the company eventually headed. And that did one major thing. It allowed us, the company, to go talk to, to, to a company and do the, the IP terms and then turn around to the university and negotiate through the option with the university. And that had the benefits at that time especially of being much faster um, and really being able to act on some company's interests. And certainly then uh, with the company and kind of going around as a group of us to these companies, company to company, it led to a better understanding of the needs and opportunities and that, that was really important for me. Now at this time it was a little bit of an adversarial relationship at times with the UW. Um, there were competing goals. The most classic of these at, the, at that time was, uh, is this really a company? Show us this is a company. You've got all this, and we've made all this important investment. It was in patent costs. You have gotta pay it back soon, soon, soon. And so that led to a real pressure to license, saying why is this a company all the time at every meeting that would come up. And, and I understand that question, and it's an important question. There's a, another part of it, who would push the technology commercialization? We were professors. Dick didn't understand much about biotechnology. So what about OTT? Well, OTT really wasn't exactly structured then to, to have people around to really help identify the, the right group to push it. So it was kind of left hanging. At the end of the day, we would go out and do the best, but we weren't very effective. We were, we, we were inexperienced. We didn't have answers to the, to the questions we should have had answers to. And so that was a big problem. At that time, especially, there was also a really big conflict of interest concerns. It's always a concern, but back then, it was, there was a, a period of time, right, when we were shopping around this company that it was a big point of concern, and I would be called to 
kind of murky meetings, honestly, that, that were vaguely or not so vaguely threatening to, to me as a professor at the University of Washington and trying to explain why I was doing a new company and how much time was I spending. And, you know, it was not very pleasant at times. And a couple of my uh, faculty colleagues had left the university around this issue. And I o always only wanted to be a professor, and I still only want to be a professor. So that was really becoming an issue for me. Um, there was some slowness in uh, negotiating this um, turnover of personnel. There, there was just you know some 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 issues. Now at this time, our technology got really complex. It was as if it wasn't already problematic enough. Um, we started doing smart materials for drug delivery, as Fiona introduced. And our technology was built really around using a very different type, but in the same class as smart polymers, to help enhance biologic drug delivery to intracellular targets. Now, at this time, the big driver of that was gene delivery. Um, back uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, that was where the big investment was, and, and we were smack dab in the middle of it with some new delivery technology. Now, this got really awkward. This is another one of my old slides <laughs> that I dug up from biomolecular switches. Now, all of a sudden, we were a company doing two very different things, and we just plunked gene delivery down with the antenna and actuator, okay? So we had a bioanalytical side, we called it, that's kind of diagnostics, and then we had polymer therapeutics. Well, you know, that becomes a strange looking company to, to investors, and it's very hard to explain. Um, it, it, hardly could you hope to find a CEO who really knew how to develop technology in both areas. Um, but that's the way it kind of got all lumped together. The, the new IP in this drug delivery area got lumped into biomolecular switches. So at this point, the plan was to establish industrial collaborations to fund the development to proof of concept in both areas. Uh, we did succeed in that um, because the technology ha had some value. We had a, a, a project funded by one of the top gene delivery companies and one of the top enzyme companies. So we kind of had a, pro a project in each area, interestingly. Well, these were the good times at the NIH when the NIH budget had doubled and we got lots of grant money too. So these were happy times. We had lots of funding. We had a mix of academic work and industry work and students and postdocs were, we were all having a great time. We were living the, the great life it is to, to be at the University of Washington um, and had our foot kind of in both areas. And, and that was a really fun, really fun thing. At this point, we were going and talking to VC people, um, and this is what we were hearing. It's great ideas, great people. It's a really cool technology, because it's, it's kind of a mixture of biology and material science that back then especially, that was a cool thing. It was sophisticated, and I learned to start fearing when they said sophisticated. Um, because then they would really start to make the point that it was really too early stage and we were too far ahead. I heard that so many meetings, we were too far ahead of ourselves. I was like, how can you be too far ahead? Uh, you know, it, with technology, I thought you were supposed to be far ahead. Um, it's a pl this is another, and this is really true, it was a platform technology with no killer app. And it was just every meeting I would hear that. Uh, you know, we said, well, you could out-license this, you know, you could spin out a diagnostics company, you could have 10 companies here, but we didn't really know what we were talking about. One of my favorite things that I got asked by a VC person, you know, they're, they're very smart, but this is a complex technology. It has the whole biology side, and it has all the details of the polymer side. And afterwards, uh, you know, he's always the nodding heads, they always seem to really be following with you. And then one of the VC uh, people asked me, well, are the polymers alive? And when I heard that question, I got very depressed. If, if they didn't realize that polymers are not living, then probably I just wasted my hour time I had with them. 
So we weren't really going anywhere, honestly, on the VC side. We'd have so many meetings. This was what our life was like. And then the VC world got really tough, because this was right around the year 2000 when we got our big couple of first industry contracts, and they were through the company, so we see, seemed to be building uh, value. And then it hit 2001, and the investment dropped. And that meant a lot of things. And in, in our area, it meant that, that they, the investors could buy established companies, because the stock market went down too, for pretty cheap. And so they were buying out existing companies who couldn't keep going rather than a startup company that had no clear story, if we're honest, about biomolecular switches, about what we, how we were going to make money. So these are some of the end results. We built a deep research base and platform capabilities. Boy, did we ever, in both areas. We were publishing and getting great results. We had no shortage of data slides in our presentation. We had really built a strong and trusting relationship, and I'm going to come back to this point, with industry. Um, we also built really good relationships with venture capital, and that also turns out to be a later part of my story. After about 2003, investment started in thawing, especially in these areas of bioanalytics, mass spectrometry, drug delivery, and so people were really knocking on our door a lot. Um, and so we developed a new multi-year funded project with the top antisense, oligonucleotide. And they were really, really super into our technology. They, they renewed two years and wanted to do a third year. And just at this time, RNA came out. Fastest discovery to Nobel Prize. Everybody wanted this technology. And the top siRNA company wanted to uh, fund a project here at UW to see if that we could develop the, our delivery technology with RNA. But unfortunately, this was when it all really kind of hit the end. Biomolecular switches was being funded through these industrial research agreements, but not separately. That means there was no VC investment. And uh, OTT at that time, under that particular head, required payment on the patent applications, and in addition said they're not going to extend the option without funding input. Well, Dick Smith had already put in enough of his money, and he wasn't going to invest at the level anyway that would be required to, to meet these requirements. And so what that meant was that the agreements with our two top companies, and especially in this exciting new area of RNA, couldn't go forward without the option because uh, the company didn't have the option anymore. So that was pretty much the end. <laughs> and uh, we were kind of in this situation. We had something, we had the, some interesting ideas, some interesting technology, but it was kind of a square peg and trying to fit into a round hole of investment at that point without the right team put together. And the end was really in 2005, but it became really official paperwork-wise in 2006, biomolecular switches went under. And uh, that was tough, really tough, because I look at the years, 1997 to 2006. That's a long time we were slugging it out trying to make this into a company that, you know, we had a lot of passion for. And, you know, I can't help but look back and say, what if we had C4C, you know, and its current incarnation that Fiona and Linda and the whole team that I'm looking out there at have put together? You know, we would have had the strong legal team right from the beginning that had a strategy about it and, and really applied for patents at a better, with better timing. And that was part of the problem with biomolecular switches have some experts around to actually help us find killer apps. Uh, that's one of the beautiful things that C4C now can help with. Um, the CEO, we needed a domain CEO. And Dick Smith was so wanting it himself. But at that time, just wasn't any obvious way. It just didn't happen. So um, pilot funding would have been huge. Uh, Licensing, SRAX, uh, sponsored research agreement expertise. We, we had, uh, you know, 
some of that, but at times, especially the sponsored research side, got really hard to do with companies who were at that, right at the moment, willing to put money in, and they couldn't wait around. SBIR, we never got a single SBIR out of it, and I look back and say, why isn't? It was just two reasons, simply. It's related to the incubator space. We didn't have a mechanism. You have to have, the company has to have space for an SBIR, and there was no way around to do that. And then the grants were kind of daunting. We were having a lot of success and writing a lot of NIH grants on our own, and so it just, it didn't happen. So, well, let's call this a life experience. It was really a tough time. Um, you know, it was kind of embarrassing at some level. It was disappointing at another level. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was tough personally for us. Um, on the good side, I learned a lot from Dick Smith, who was an entrepreneur. He, he was really an amazing person. He, he was very optimistic. He interacted with people and really believed in people. And that, that was a really good lesson for me. Um, he, uh, he, he put me in touch, and really through a lot of work on his side, that, that I had so much interaction with biopharma and diagnostics. And it, it, to this day, it continues to inform my research and our group's research. Had a great academic period with Alan, papers, talks, all that. So I know this is going to be a theme, at least from the titles of faculty telling you there's, you can have your cake and eat it too. I mean, it was so great for my academic life. It helped me recognize and direct our academic research toward real needs. Um, and it, the two net always synergistically interacted. Never did I find a negativity there, other than conflict of interest. Uh, students and postdocs directly benefited through people and company connections. It really helped them get jobs and helped me help them get jobs. And uh, I have, you know, great friends in industry that I, I, you know, see all the time and keep in touch with scientifically. Well, it turns out that in November, of 2006, biomolecular switches, I got the piece of paper saying it had been terminated. Uh, in December, I got a phone call from uh, Bob Overell, who I had presented to when he was a VC person at Fraser. So he told me he had left Fraser and he wanted to get back to earlier stage technology development. And he remembered our presentation. And while Frazier had declined, he thought it was interesting. And this was one of those relationship pieces. So he stopped by and talked to us. Um, and so this, starting in December 2006, we developed new new company. So <laughs> that is how fast that turnaround went. Uh, and we formed a new company eventually called PhaseRx. Um, so much easier at this point in time onward. Um, Bob negotiated the license with UW, um, and we uh, made venture presentations prepared and made them over 2007. And I went with him, it was the two of us, and that was another great experience for me to go through that uh, from a, a much higher level. When I had uh, pre previously done this, I could see all of a sudden what we were doing wrong. Um, and the company was, you know, also related to the timing, this new excitement in uh, uh, small interfering RNA technology, new polymer synthetic approaches, and, but it built on a lot of our old work. Our old work put us in a position that very few people around the world uh, had from a technology base. So uh, eventually this was the, uh, the, the good start, uh, it got venture funding initially of 19 million. I think they're up to about 30 million now of funding. This is how I think of the PhaseRx leadership team. Just when we were in trouble, the L's saved us. This is what they really look like. Uh, you know, it's kind of, it was a dream team. It still is to me. Um, Bob Overell, um, who became uh, the CEO, um, formerly of Frazier um, and uh, Immunex. Paul Johnson, who had just left NASTEC, at that time it was the largest Seattle biotech company, um, where he was CSO, and he came over and became our CSO. And uh, Paul was uh, really fun to work with, technically, um, and uh, still part of PhaseRx. And then our venture 
group was just really outstanding. We had Steve Gillis, who was a chair. The lead investor was Arch Ventures. You know, Steve is one of the legends. He founded Immunex, Carixa, and you know, all of a sudden you find yourself working with him after you'd just been through a really down period at the end of the first company. Uh, John Diekman from 5AM Ventures, uh, who built Affymetrics, one of the legendary companies uh, in the Bay Area, and Brian Atwood um, from Versant Ventures. So those two were from the Bay Area. Also has an amazing history, Brian does. So this was a little better life experience, I would say, overall. I'm ki kidding, actually. They were both incredible life experiences. Um, I've learned so much and continue to learn from Bob and his team. Uh, continue to learn about cutting edge problems. Just this morning, having a great uh, discussion with our group about one of the big problems we're excited about now that Biopharma has found finally. Um, great academic period, student and postdocs. Well, it's a little harder to get great jobs right now, but, but we have more connections than usual, at least. Um, and especially with C4C and UW, it's now it's just fun to do this. <laughs> Honestly, you took away some of the, uh, the, the old, un, more unpleasant parts of it. There's just a mentality of startup around here now. So that's mainly my story, but I want to close just because my title was there and back again, because there was still that diagnostics company that I started out with, that I always wanted to form right from the beginning, and I thought that's what I was going to do first. Um, but we've come back now to company two is Nextgenia, um, which is a diagnostics company. Um, and. Uh, Nextgenia, this is its technology. It involves smart materials. They're, they're not exactly what we started with back in the 1990s, but um, current uh, hospital assays, or 80% of them are run in these large uh, instruments shown here, um, and they run immunoassays to decide you know, how much and whether you have a certain disease biomarker. Um, the current technology that uh, dominates this from a reagent standpoint are magnetic particles or beads um, and they use immobilized antibodies on those beads to capture the biomarker but there's a huge push because of the interest in biomarkers to get faster more sensitive assays and from a business standpoint more assays per shift and new biomarkers allows these companies to place their instrument better theoretically, and that's why they have had a lar long history of investing and acquiring new reagent technologies. And so if you really can make a, a faster, more sensitive assay with new reagent technology, there's a good track record of, of acquisitions for such companies. The current microbeads are very large, um, and Nextgenia was always built around this question, do we have the best solid state? And the answer we would say is no, in principle at least. They move, they're still large enough, they move very slowly in water and they have low surface area to volume, which means it's very hard to drive binding of the biomarkers. And uh, it's well kind of known from first principles that really small magnetic particles, nanoparticles, have dramatically better binding. But what they don't tell you is that the, once you get to a really small size, they don't pull over to a magnet anymore. And that's why we're kind of been constrained to these large magnetic beads that do pull over uh, to the magnet. So we'd like to get here, but we have to come over, overcome some, some issues. And uh, these smart polymers allow you um, in principle a way to do this. Uh, if you put the smart polymer on very small Magnetic nanoparticles, these are, uh, have core sizes below 10 nanometers in size. They're almost become the size of the macromolecules themselves. Um, they can reversibly aggregate uh, the particles and antibodies and biomarkers that are attached to them. So during the binding steps, you can react with high surface area and fast diffusion to drive binding of rare biomarkers. But then you can have your cake and eat it too and aggregate these to what is essentially a large particle when you need to do the separation step and run the assay. So uh, Dr. James Lyon, our group, has been really instrumental in developing this technology. He's one of the co-founders and he made this nice movie. Um, this is a real-time movie and that's a real magnet, just a simple little magnet. Uh, so 
uh, the magnetic particles, nanoparticles are suspended in solution. The color is from the magnetic nanoparticles, um, but they're in, suspended in solution. And so what you're going to see, the smart phase transition of the polymers that aggregate can be seen uh, when you add just a little bit of salt. This is a salt responsive polymer. Um, you're going to see it pipetted in. And that causes the polymer to change. And then in real time, the nanoparticles aggregate and pull over uh, to the magnet. So, so you can have the binding, and then you can have the separation, too, of, of what's effectively becomes a larger particle. So I'm not going to describe all this technology. It's a play for in vitro diagnostics first and other life sciences. But this is the summary slide. This is how this company worked, very differently and much quicker. If, you, if I gave you the timeline of this company, it would be you know, compressed by tenfold. Um, we had a super strong legal team in-house that continues to be a joy to work with. They do provisionals, but they help us with strategy. And I'll show you Andrew's picture on the next couple slides. Uh, the entrepreneurs in residence program really led us to start Nextgenia. Uh, it found us Tom Schulte, shown up above, who started the company. He has incredible domain experience. He's from uh, one of the largest diagnostics companies. He knows the field, could see where this technology fit in, and got excited about starting a company. Immediately different situation than biomolecular switches, who had uh, all of us who didn't really know what we were doing. Pilot funding continues to be available to help us make the manufacturing of these particles more real, to demonstrate key proofs of concept. Um, and I'll mention as well the larger, you know, kind of ecosystem of pilot funding around WRF and LSDF and C4C have all come together around this and made it possible. Um, incredible licensing and sponsored research agreement expertise now. It's so fast, and Fiona's done a really great job in developing all that up. Um, helped us get an SBIR. We just got a $1.2 million grant for this technology. That gets us down the road, along with the pilot funding, really nicely. Helped write the grant, and Tom, being helped us find the CEO could write that grant in a very compelling way. So we've been through phase one and phase two already. Um, and we've been able, connected to the SBIR and other funding, to have a real space uh, for, to make all that possible at the incubator space. So thank you, C4C. So I got to thank my lab group. You know, over 22 years, by far the biggest joy and the biggest contributors of anybody have been the research group. And so it's a pleasure for me to look out at the people who are doing this now, but uh, many people in the past. And they've just been incredible. You know, you, you, time passes. You have to overcome a lot of problems. And they've been the real story. And they are co-inventors. I, I, I can't think of any patent that I don't have co-inventors. Um, from our students and postdocs. And finally, thank you, C4C. Um, it's just been tremendous what Lyndon and Fiona have uh, brought here from a, a standpoint of really evolving uh, technology commercialization. I gave you just a, such a quick summary, but it's really been impactful and it's super exciting for myself, who's been through um, what it was like in the past. Um, had great technology managers, uh, Valerie and now Lisa. Um, I mentioned Andrew, who's been a, a tremendous help, especially with Nextgenia uh, around the, the legal side and patenting side. And one person who's been here, I know as long as me, is David Brown. He was a graduate of bioengineering, and, and David's been uh, through this with us since start. I don't know if David's here, but thank you. Um, I could have put more pictures up there, I, I know, but uh, it's been... Uh, just incredible to see the evolution of C4C and impacts me. But um, also, I put the picture of molecular engineering in there because we're not stopping now. And uh, it's also been fun to work with them programmatically um, to help build this entrepreneurial uh, spirit here at UW. So thanks very much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have.
question. Yeah. 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 You mentioned that one of the things I know that you've been involved in when you're transferring the technology out from the university to companies, that quite often that there's quite a few steps in that process and um, what the company wants out of a technology, what the university is doing with it are a little different. I was wondering if you could comment on any lessons learned about that. Well, there is definitely a tension there, and an ongoing tension that I, I, you know, do d still deal with, especially with PhaseRx, which is venture funded, has their own space, and you know, uh, obviously they're a completely different entity. Nextgenia is still here at, at the university and still largely operating in our lab, so they're very different in that respect. PhaseRx is where that that becomes more of an issue as we develop new technologies. Um, either in a new area or especially in one of the existing areas that, that uh, Phase RX is operating in, there can become a tension um, about where does this new technology go. For the most part, it only makes sense that it goes through the existing license and the existing venture funded uh, company, which do, has done an amazing job further developing the technology and industrializing it. So, there's mainly that good side to it. You actually feel like things that we're developing in our, our lab has a mechanism you know, to help uh, phase RX and to help it get out to patients, which is what we ultimately care about. But that being said, they have a focus. And sometimes we work outside that focus area, say in vaccines or protein delivery, and there can be a tension there that arises because they're not directly able to accelerate it at the speed we would like to see it accelerated, and yet some of the core delivery technology is still covered under the license. So that's kind of the dilemma. Um, the prior IP does impact um, and have a foundational position relative to new IP. So that's a matter of negotiation to really get the terms of, say, a sub-license or uh, if, when it rises to that level with phase RX. Uh, I've not had that problem, and, and I'm also uh, kind of sworn not to let that happen through my conflict of interest agreement here. So we're, we cannot direct you know, university research to the good of PhaseRx. Now, that being said, sometimes the two are very nicely aligned, because if you're working on a, a true you know, pharma medical need, then you can be aligned with phase RX. And, and uh, then there are rules that govern, you know, how much is done at the university and when it's uh, given. Usually if it's in a uh, non-confidentiality situation, then you can tell phase RX about it. So th there is a tension there and you, it has to be managed between conflict of interest, concerns, uh, wanting to get the technology developed as fast as you can, and it, it's really a management issue, and I have people who help manage that at the university. Yeah, Shell. A little earlier in your talk, you talked about conflict of interest, and it, it sounded to me, from what you were saying, that uh, there was a period of time, maybe 10 years ago, where it was a greater concern uh, that the university had managing conflict of interest from their professors. Has that changed? Lately, and if it has, uh, what is responsible for the change in attitude? So the, the question, just so everybody makes sure and they heard it, was about the conflict of interest. And I mentioned there was a time period, um, 10 to 15 years ago, where, where it was a major issue around new company startup. And what has changed, maybe? Um, and is it different, and, and what has changed? I feel, myself, it's greatly changed. Uh, and I, I think mainly the reason is cultural. Now, there's probably some changes in the legality around conflict of interest as well. Uh, but let me tell you what I experienced from a cultural standpoint. Back in the, the period where there was a lot of trouble with startups, uh, there, as I mentioned, there were certain administrators at the university who would just have a problem with starting new companies, period. Without a lot of basis, legal basis, or without a lot of considerations of how to, to manage that situation, there was a, a sense maybe that the, the university doesn't have a lot to gain, it, but it has a, a lot to lose if, you know, if something bad happens. 
that's kind of cultural at the time. There were certain people involved. It, it's, there's always people involved. There's a certain sense, even from the state government and the attorney general's office at that time period made some statements and rulings. And, and so what has changed is now I don't get that sense. Now I get the sense that, that it's valued to commercialize, to translate, to start, new, and new companies are maybe even a preferred way to do that where, where it makes sense from a technology standpoint as opposed to licensing. Um, so I now mainly go into meetings and I'm not, cons I don't even think about all the potential negatives until later. I, I, you're mainly saying how can we get this technology commercialized and, and heading at least have a chance to be developed toward clinical use in our case of, for our technologies. I think that's mainly a cultural change and I, all I can do is applaud it um, and, and believe me, compare it to what it, what it was 10 to 15 years ago. So um, there may be legal issues that I'm not so aware of as well, um, but at the end of the day, the NIH and the federal government also has laws and rules saying it's our responsibility to capture the potential of their investment, medical research investment, for patients. And in my opinion, for our technologies, that's always going to mean that you have to have a mechanism for commercialization be it through licensing or company startup, and it's, it's a question of which is the best route to, to give the technology its best try. I mean, they're all very unlikely to succeed at the end of the day, but, but we could never get there at the university with the, our technologies. I'm sure, I know there are technologies where you can get there from the university, but not with ours. They have to be commercialized through a, a company. Yeah, Lisa. So what recommendations would you have to other researchers Well, the, it's such simple advice, but now it's very straightforward. As I was mentioning, a C4C has all of these mechanisms in place, and so the first point is to go meet them and talk to them if you haven't ever done that, um, and see what uh, the range of services that could be applied to your, to your technology, what the best combination or order of those would be. Um, They've created so many of these. They have, they, the, part of it is informational. You can go to seminars that will help you kind of see the pathway that's in front of you just at the university and what kind of services are available at C4C. We, they have the entrepreneurial faculty and part of our job is to help you uh, to, to get a sense of how it would actually work. What should I do first? What should I do next? And so uh, I have a lot of contact with faculty who, who want to see, how, you know, what should they do? To, to, how did, how, what should their first step be is always the first question. So I meet with a lot of them, but uh, that will get you kind of into the system. And what's beautiful about the new C4C system, I call it new, it's probably not that new. I'm old, so I'm comparing it to 20 years ago. But uh, is that it kind of, they suck you in in a good way and then they start helping you with the next steps, you know, and uh, they apply people to your technology to think about it, to uh, say, well, well, you know, is this the right time for IP? That's usually one of the early steps. Uh, you know, is this a light, help you think through licensing or a new company startup? And then it just kind of, you, you walk through the process. But there's such an incredible, built-in support system now that's so diverse in terms of all the different things that have to come together to start a new company or, or license that just getting there is the first easy piece of advice. Just get there. And uh, you're, you're certainly, that's part of our job is from the, if you know you need or want to talk to a faculty person, then that's what part of the reason why we're here as faculty fellows. Adam, I wanted to ask about the sort of complexity between a diagnostic and a therapeutic play. And so, BizRx is down the therapeutic route, uh, it seems, your new company, Diagnostics. But presumably, the IP can be used for both. And um, I'm wondering if you're taking a field license for diagnostics only and you have an option of therapeutics. It 
it's just complicated opportunity, for both opportunities, so I wanted to comment on that. Sure. So the, the question had to do with, uh, you know, the IP that led to diagnostics versus therapeutics and whether there's an intersection there and the, any complexities uh, in terms of developing NextGenia next versus PhaseRx. So in our case, there's been remarkably little overlap, interestingly. They're, they're at a high level, they're, they're smart polymers, but they're quite different for the, the different areas. Now that being said, there is a point of, inter, has been a point of intersection. And so next, because PhaseRx went first and negotiated their license for a particular set of polymers and, and applications. But their license, the, the key question there is therapy versus life science versus diagnostics or field of use questions. And so uh, PhaseRx has a field of use. Well, it started out quite broad, but then when NextGenia came back and wanted access to a particular uh, compositional space for diagnostics, there was a negotiation and we were able to resolve it by creating, I think, a sub-license from PhaseRx to, to NextGenia at, you know, no barrier, basically. So it's interesting, that has come up in one situation, but it really comes down to field of use and what the particular licenses look like. But again, C4C was very responsive to, uh, to NextGenia, and so was PhaseRx, uh, in thinking through that field of, issue, field of use question versus a compositional space, and it turned out that that it just worked out because there, there wasn't any obvious overlap in terms of their, their business goals. But I can imagine other cases where that, that wouldn't have gone so smoothly, but, but it comes down to that, negotiating around field of use and what the licenses look like and how they can be amended. What is the difference between sponsored research when it comes to uh, academy lab and uh, startup? Uh, well, uh, the, the case with biomolecular switches, the, the, our very first company, the way that was structured was that the company set up uh, a sponsored research with the company, and then the company, biomolecular switches, turned around and made an agreement with Office of Technology Transfer, licensing, I can't remember which it was at the time, but uh, so that was the interesting model because they didn't have space, it was a virtual company. And so there were two agreements uh, that had to be done through that, through that mechanism. But the good thing for the company was it did build value. The company could show investment. Um, but then, and we were operating by subcontracting. Uh, with Phase RX, there's been periods of time uh, in the past, not currently, where they have funded uh, research under a sponsored research agreement with the University of Washington, and that's funded a postdoc um, in our group uh, to, to do certain types of research. Uh, so sponsored research agreements from a university standpoint are, are just between some outside entity, you know, and, and the University of Washington. So I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, though. Was that what the question was? Yeah, sure. You're a founder of this company, but you're also a professor. I'm curious if you uh, play any role or a significant role in developing uh, management decisions or strategic developing strategies for companies, or I mean, what is your, do you play an active role? In yeah, the question is my kind of ongoing role. For faculty, yeah, that's a key question. And I mentioned it once, and I'll mention it again, that. I never, myself, I think I've got the best job in the world. I, I, I want to stay a professor. <laughs> and I, I never even, you know, I, there was a time I thought about taking like a year sabbatical and, and maybe, you know, being involved with the company in a different, more involved way. But, but it, it's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward when you stay a professor. Once the company is really started and, and going, you, our role is then limited to an advisory role. Um, so I have, with PhaseRx, for example, a formal consulting agreement that has to get approved by the UW, and there's just a process for that. 
but in that consulting, it's, there's no, I cannot be talking about ongoing research in our lab that's non-confidential, that you wouldn't be making available, freely available in talks, you know, or posters or discussions at the university. So, uh, and that's always the case with a consulting agreement. In terms of advisory, as part of that consulting, I can give them my advice on areas, you know, that I think are good or uh, advice on their materials, you know, but, but, it, but it cannot, that's what I got to somehow keep clean. And it's, you know, you can imagine there's some complexity there. Um, I have to keep, keep clean what we're actually doing from what I'm advising on. Uh, but I think we both found it productive for me to continue to be involved with, with the company from that standpoint. But it's not on directions of the company, it's around the technology. With Nextgenia, Nextgenia is a virtual company operating here, so we still have a lot of interactions on the research side. And, and again, you just have to manage that intersection between the company, and it's, the nice thing is that it can be uh, distributed by funding. Those people who are paid by the company versus those that are paid off of grants, just you ha you're in a different situation there. But yet there's exchange of information, there's no doubt about that. So that's one of the things you, you just have to manage and there are people here who help you, you know, decide uh, in a tough situation. I sometimes ask the question, what's, what's allowed, what's not allowed? We should probably continue the conversation over the happy hour of drinks and food. Um, thank you, Pat, for your talk today. And I'd just like to mention to people, in addition to the ongoing seminar series for the Entrepreneurial Faculty Fellows, there's also um, a seminar series every other Friday at the New Ventures facility where we're bringing in um, outside entrepreneurs to give talks on how to develop your technology and start a company. So if you haven't already signed up for those, check them out. So thank you, Pat. Thank you. Yeah.